man. Ready, ready to get to it, brother. All right. Okay, we got the legendary cocaine. Um, uh, he's he's worked with everybody and anybody from Easy E to Snoop Dogg, uh, Nipsey Hussle, Too Short, The Game, Tony Yayo, The Outlaws, and there's too many, too many more to mention. Mm-hmm. And do you do you mind starting off? Uh, telling us where you, where you're from and how you got started in music. Well, I'm from a town called Pomona. It's in California, and uh, originally I was born in South Bronx, New York, but it was too cold out there, so moms and pops moved. And uh, I come from a musical background. My father' name is Jerry Buddy Long Senior. He was a a legend at Motown Records as a arranger, writer, composer, orchestrator, director. So some of the greatest songs that you ever heard in, uh, you know, uh, R&B history, uh, uh, my dad had hands on it, you know, such acts like um, Papa Was a Rolling Stone by The Temptation, Just My Imagination, uh, basically a slew of hits over there at Motown, some of the greatest stuff you ever want to hear and then my uncle is uncle willie hutch who was a great writer uh from the 60s and 70s and 80s his works include um doing the soundtracks for different movies such as the mac uh he also wrote i'll be there songs like brother's gonna work it out i choose you just a real you know popular soulful artist so music has always been in my dna you know it was I had the cheat code and growing up in Pomona, California, uh, we had an outlet. When I talk about we, me and my cousin quote 187 from one of the most prolific group groups out the West was above the law. And we always had music in our household, you know, from soul to jazz to uh, rock and roll uh, to classical. And then the explosion of hip hop came in the 70s. And it was just a big pot of gumbo. So I was exposed to that. And I remember walking in the studio into one of my dad's sessions in the mid 70s. And the running board looked like a spaceship. So I knew I was like, hey, man, I'm a star child at this age. And I knew I was very serious about music, even at uh, five years old. But when I started taking it very serious, around 12 or 13 years old. Wow, man, that's that's awesome. And I see you got the nickname, the King of Features. Um, can you explain why that is? Well, we didn't set out to do the King of Features. We weren't even thinking about that. You know, at a time to when, you know, I first signed the Ruthless Records, it was no secret to controversy. Eric Wright, the late great Easy E, rest in peace. He loved controversy, you know, niggas with attitudes above the law. Now he got one of the most controversial names in the in the game, which is cocaine. But we turn it around and spell it K-O-K-A-N-E. Not that we're advocating selling drugs like some junk. This is some big John Gotti guy. You know what I mean? Yeah. No, it was to say that when you hear cocaine music and you hear his funk, you're going to get hooked. Warning, listening may become addicting. But back then, in the late 80s and the early 90s, the FCC laws out here wouldn't permit them to say cocaine on the radio. But that didn't stop my cousin, Cole 187, and Dr. Dre and Easy e to put me on more stuff because they felt cocaine is so different. It's, it's perfect. His name is like that because when you take somebody on cocaine, it's a euphoria and their mind going this way. Well, that's how his music is. So they they challenged me to get on these records. And my first platinum record was writing um, for, for NWA. I co-wrote Easy es um, part on Appetite of Destruction. I wrote his 10 Gangster Commandments, just as well as introducing a character called Sweet Talk on the intro, along with the late great, KMG, Co-187, myself, and MC Ran. When the first time you hear that intro on Eva Fazagan album, which is Niggas for Life, you hear cocaine and above the law. So that was a good thing. They always used to put me on different stuff because 
They was like, I have never heard nobody, and this is they they words verbatim. Uh, they said, I have never heard nobody that sound like ten different people in one. <laughs> You know what I mean? So they would be like, man, you sound dead on dead eye on on George Clinton, Rick James, Curtis Mayfield, you know, and plus you rap like cocaine, you every bit of your name, cocaine. So we, you know, I started doing a lot of hooks and a lot of features, but I was an MC first before I was thinking about singing. And it just worked for me, you know. Those guys put me up to the test and it worked. And during the time that Easy E unfortunately passed the complications of AIDS, um, it froze up all the assets at Ruthless Records. And I had to just, you know, it was no monies coming in. And I just had to work, 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 work. So 10 times out of 10, I would go to like a session with uh, Too Short because we known each other for a minute or E-40 or whoever. And they would be like 10 times out of 10 and put that on. Yeah. I like the way that sound. So it created a safe haven over the years, you know, all the way going to, you know, messing with a uh, doghouse Snoop Dogg label. It just kept snowballing and snowballing. And like around, I would say, like around 10 years ago, my wife stopped me and said, boom, paused. You know how many features you want? I'm like, no, I never did think like that. You know what I mean? I knew I was on a lot of features because I was, hinting towards that in certain songs that I had, but I didn't know I was on thousands of features. You know what I mean? And my wife said, let me do some homework. Let me take the attorney that we have and take my team and let's do extensive homework on it. It didn't take overnight, man. It took about two years for them to do the homework because we wanted to make sure we do fact checking with other artists that have that claim. And we just don't want to look like we were lying to kick it. And lo and behold, she documented everything, her and my attorney, and come to find out, man, cocaine is the most featured recording collaborative artist in the history of the business out of any genre of music. Thousands of features. Yeah. It's too many to name right now. You know what I mean? So some of those features that I did was on multi-platinum artists, multi-gold uh, artists, independent artists all over the world. You know what I mean? And then I would do, you know, a collection of songs with one artist, like take Snoop, for instance. I did like over 50 or 60 songs with him that is counted as a feature. So even though it's over 4,000 features, it's about 1,000 uh, and three artists that I touch over this 30 plus years ride. Wow, man, that's, that's crazy. That's, so that's I was like, wow, that's something good because number one, Primarily, it's inspirational for a third generation, which is my daughter, who's a singer. You know, her grandfather's the great Jerry Long, and her pops is the legendary uh, uh, cocaine Jerry Long Jr. Now, my daughter, Anissa Long, she's the third generation. So primarily, we wanted to consolidate and gather up all the work that I've done to first inspire your family. And then it's a whole set of generations that I, I was fortunate enough to raise to really understand the impact and the body of work of this one character named Cocaine. Wow, yes. That's amazing work ethic. I love it. That's, that's crazy numbers, man. I'm, yeah, I don't even know what to say, man. That's so cool. Thanks, man. It's, yeah. it's humbling. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of people are like, wow, that's I don't believe it. But when they actually see it, um, they're just blown away because a lot of times people see it and we encourage people to fact check. Yeah. And when they fact check, man, they just blown away. And the good thing about, you know, people that are fact checking this claim that the legendary cocaine is the most featured collaborative artist, it's good because when they come back and say, I did not know. I get to have a more of a humble approach yeah. and let them know about, you know, even though it's cool to accolades, you still got to have the right attitude to determine your altitude. And that's going to have, make you have longevity because in, in this business, you, you know, one thing that helped me, you know, stay this long is, is the fact that I kept it humble. I put God and family first and I always, you know, care about young artists around the world that really don't get a break 
And I was fortunate enough to get a break from Above the Law, Lay Law, who introduced me to Easy e Right. And I want to give that same thing to youngsters out there that never give up. You know, you, you'll look up and one day you'll you'll create something that that no one can take away from you. So it's so it's mostly when we do the most featured artists. It's not for arrogant purposes, of course not. It's to show the body of work, but mainly it's to inspire my family and to inspire so many artists out there that I have roadblocks here and there. Like that doesn't matter if you believe in your dreams and you stay consistent and it's really for you. You're going to go through the struggles with an understanding, but you're going to come out on, on top with that understanding, too, of perseverance. Yeah, for sure. I, I know when I was the last week, I've been looking up, doing a bit of research on you, and I was just like, man, I could be here forever. Just mm -hmm. you've done so much stuff, man. It's real cool. I, I just love what you, you, how you do things, too, and you always watch on your lives man you're just so cool to your fans as well like humble. thanks man you know well I, one thing that i know is that you know when god gives you the spotlight or he opens up a door for you or for those that really don't believe in god just believing in yourself you know um it's tough yeah it's tough being in this business because first of all, this business is very brutal. You have a lot of people that, if you're not careful, will will mess up your business. If you're not careful, you'll be the sacrificial lambs for you know faulty management, faulty publishing, faulty all kind of things. So one thing that I encourage the youngsters to do is really, you know, if they study cocaine or study the greats. They have to study how are they able to transcend and last this long for over three decades. Well, you got to sit down and you really got to, to handle your business. You got to research. You got to learn because the creative side is so easy. But because of the brutal business side, it's really 90% that you have to maximize business as opposed to the creativity. And I didn't pay enough sacrifice to tell a youngster, nah, man, that might not be the way that's going to be beneficial for your brand and your career. So it's a beautiful thing to be an elder, yeah. still relevant because all kind of people all over the world, you know, I'm fortunate. I, I guess they still like the sound. I get a lot of requests, not just from our 35 and up gender, but now, you know, it's it's amazing to see those cats that are 18, between 18 and 30. Now, like, wow, you did this for the, you put three people in the Hall of Fame and you on all these features and no one ever know. I mean, you know, the good thing about it is talking to these youngsters and up and coming artists is that they need somebody to show them love. They don't need somebody to show them arrogance. They don't need somebody to show whoop de -woo, because that doesn't do nothing and i have a saying be careful who you talk to because i might be i might be schooling the next president so i'm yeah. very careful and very humble that that i can articulate the inspiration over to a younger audience and upcoming artists in general wow that's, that's awesome man and even just going back to your live you're saying like I remember the other day, you're like, oh, something's good that's going to happen for you today. You know, you just had, like, this positive message, and I was like, yeah, something's good that's going to happen for me. And then I talked to you, and then I got another person lined up, and it was just, you know, like, I don't know. I think you just changed my mindset, like a little bit of a fire. Oh, man, happy to happy to intercede, man. But yeah, all this stuff flows through the universe, man. Where you get to a point in place. What a man think is what you sow and the fruits that you labor for and what you put out in the universe, you'll get exactly paid accordingly to what you put out. So I'd be very careful not to let this matrix system make you talk against your focus, against your consistency, and against your motivation and energy and confidence. You need all those bullet points to continue to go past 
the struggles of life every single day because the struggles will try to plead a good case and then we'll try to bring your vibration down to a lower vibration. And a lot of times we're dealing from a lower vibration because there's 5Gs, there's frequencies, there's towers, there's negative energy, there's wars on television. So you sometimes have to navigate that by shutting that out and really being the most simple, simple, what is the most simple thing to, to believe and stay confident? You got to go back to a child. A child does, is not concerned when it goes goo goo gaga. He knows his mother is going to give him his breast milk, the poor responsible mother. So you have to take that same analogy. And when you do, it helps breed more confidence, surety about where you're going in life. But you got to go through the thorns and thistles in order to have this type of mentality. So I went through all those things. A lot of people be like, you know, why are you happy? Why are you joyful? It's because I went through those thorns and thistles and it wasn't no pretty ride. But I understand why diamonds are made and I understand why the pressure is there to make those diamonds. And longer the pressure, the more rare of a diamond. So God allowed me to become a rare diamond. Man, that's beautiful. And another thing you said stuck to me, you know, you, you've got to find your Luke Skywalker. Like, yeah. And yeah. I like, man. So, so cool. I'm always happy, man. I'm always, I wasn't like this all the time. And there's things that come, you know, uh, life ain't going to be peaches and cream every day, but it's how, it's not how you get hit. It's how you respond. Yeah. You know, I, I've seen another, in another interview, and something that's like moved me. You talk about Easy E and and how he helps you out in a time of need. Are you able to tell that story now for people who are watching who haven't heard it? Well, you know, Easy meant more to us. You know, above the long cocaine. Yeah, Easy Eric Wright meant more to me than just my boss, my CEO, um, and above the law. I'll tell you a story. Um, see, a lot of people see things from a speculative point of view because they never met the man. They're from Alps. They hear stories. They hear, they hear different narratives. A lot, some of those narratives are not true. Some of those narratives is pack seats in the movies. Now, what Easy meant to me was far more than just signing to the label. He actually cared about his artists. You know, um, during the time, me and my wife, shout out to my queen, because I've been with her 38 years and we've been married 32 and we have eight wonderful children. But my firstborn was identical twins with my wife and they were born premature seven months. But they were they were going they were having complications in the hernia area and the stomach area that wasn't going to be good. So at a time to when I lived uh, about an hour and a half to two hours away. It was a place called Fontana, California. And Easy was out in Calabasas doing a multi-million dollar deal. I needed the money at that time because I'm sorry to tell you, American health system stinks. And it still stinks to this day. I did not have the money at that time. I was promised the money a following two weeks, but I needed the money today. Easy E broke his meeting in Calabasas, got to Fontana in an hour, which really takes an hour and a half to two hours with traffic, and dropped off racks. And he said, man, go take care of your kids, man. Them your first kids, not on my clock. Man, I got you, man. Go take care of your kids. And because of that, you know, they, it was success, very successful uh, surgery. They had surgery. Yeah. Um, and now today they don't have any complications. They're 31 years old. And because of Eric, you know, God using Eric to intervene is the reason why they're healthy today, brother. So oh. Eric meant more to me, you know, than just a brother from Compton or boom. And even if I would have met him on that basis, that would have been straight enough. But 
because I had the chance to experience this man that don't have nothing to do with lights, camera, and action is the reason why I will always, always celebrate Mr. Eric Wright. Yeah, that's incredible. What, what a guy. Yeah, because the misconception, you hear a lot of things, easy was this and that. No, 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 easy didn't do none of that. Yeah. I mean, this is the music business. He found out later that, hey, there was some discrepancies that wasn't correct, and he was going to fire Jerry Heller, and he was going to put N.W.A. back together. Yeah. But, you know, he did so much in such little time that, you know, just like Tupac, you know. Yeah. You know, they still here, but it's incredible how they were able to do so yeah. much in a lifetime that people can't do in three lifetimes. Yeah, they just packed it all into such a short time. It's still yeah. going but, today. Did yeah. you have any experiences? So, with, oh, sorry. So when Easy when Easy died, I was just I had I was fortunate enough to have those artists give me invitations so I can feed my family. And it just so happened years later, I became the most featured collaborative artist in the world. Wow. Man, that's, that's such a blessing too. And you, you deserve it though. You're just, you're talented and, you know, hardworking. It's like everything you deserve. Mm -hmm. And I love well, I that you're always that. taking care of your family and stuff, man. That's awesome. Yeah, that's what it's about, man. We need, uh, we need examples, not samples in this game. You know, everybody, there's a lot of people talk to talk, but then they become a sample or a moment or a soundbite. No, this is how I run my program. I, I'm a father. I'm a dedicated husband, dedicated father. I've learned to put away certain things that by design, whether it wasn't good or bad, it really helped me open up my third eye. And this is what I do. This is who I am. I I, I don't do the hypocritical thing. I don't hang out. I'm not I, I'm not throwing stripping stripping money in the strip clubs and nothing. I mean, I don't knock people from doing it. I used to be a part of that, but I'm on another way of thinking. I'm on family generation generational wealth right now, and that's the things that I try to uh, exchange over to a wider audience that are in, maybe inspired by the music, but I want them to be inspired, not just by the music. What, what is there to help you sustain the music in it? And it just was my family. Wow. That helped me sustain. That's perfect, man. You'd be a great mentor. Like, Thanks, that's, man. That's, yeah, for sure. Like, yeah, that's, Love how your outlook on everything. Uh, one thing I wanted to ask you, like, what was your, I guess, your lowest moment in your career, followed by your highest moment, and how you've come to be in the space that you are now? Um, losing people is the toughest situation you could ever go through. It's mind wrenching. It's heartbreaking. It's numbness. And I was able to articulate that and put my pain on paper through music. Like it's a song, for instance, it's still to this day, no matter how many songs I did, uh, it's a song called No Pain, No Gain. And that was off uh, 1994 Ruthless Records release, an album called Funk Upon a Rhyme. Legendary album. That's really G-Funk out, you know? But the song was actually played at Easy es funeral and so many funerals. So, you know, to hear that type of song still to this day, how people, you know, lets me know that there's no, there's never no such thing as outdated music or certain things like that. Because if, it, if it's able to inspire people, it'll be around forever. You know what I mean? And I was able to put that record out and that's why I'm so adamant for the ones that I, I was able to work with. You talking about your KMGs, you talking about your, you know, of course, Easy E's, LA Dre's, your Nate Dogs, your Nipsey Hustles, your Tupac's, your Mac Dre's, your Jay Dillas. 
they're not here no more. So I'm a lot, a lot of times I'm adamant on really celebrating those that are simply not here that shared their whole experience, not only with me, but to the world. And as a participant or a disciple of those great artists that are not here in the physical, I really get to share to the audience how it was. Man, that's that's good. Day. I was actually listening to that song today. Yeah, I was, I was going so it's a lot of people that is just that, of course, badass. Shout out to badass. Yeah, there's like, of course, prodigy. I mean, these people that I'm naming, we were we were talking like we were friends, we we're buddies, and they're not here no more. Yeah, you know, and they will always be around forever because. You know, I tell people, man, if you you don't have to, you know, if, if somebody doing music and they have a certain style, I always encourage artists to put some positivity and some balance in your music because people tend to remember music that inspires them. Yeah. Man. That's, That's why they still remember to this day. Yeah. Who's been your favorite, your favorite person to work with, like over the years? Or like favorite. There's a lot of cats now, <laughs> man. There's a lot of cats, but you know, of course, the ones that are not here. Yeah. You know, um, your Nate Dogs, your Nipsey Hussles. Um, there's so many. Uh, the ones that are living, of course, my cousin Cole 187. It was a blessing to see Dr. Dre, how he, he does stuff, working with Quick, uh, George Clinton, yeah. Bootsy Collins, yeah. uh, Larry Blackman from Cameo, uh, on the East Coast, uh, working with cats like Prodigy, Rest in Peace, him and Alchemist. Great production producers. Uh, it's just a lot, a lot, you know. Working with uh, Cats West Coast, uh, Battle Cat. Yeah, I love Battle Cat. It's, it's just a lot of cats, man, that I was able to not just touch from the West Coast, but from the East, from the South. You know, people don't even know if I say Jay Dilla, Cocaine is on record with Jay Dilla. It'd be like, huh? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. You know, so it's 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 a mystery and mystique about cocaine, which I like. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because I'm so humble. I'm not I'm I don't want to be all on the television all every yeah. five seconds. That was not my lane. I don't knock people that do it. Yeah. I mean, but I like the way things are going. It's like the quiet legend, but you know, doing what I'm doing. So I work with a lot of great cats, man. Hold yeah. on right quick. I work with a lot of great cats, man. Uh, I even worked with uh, Jenny Rivera. Jenny Rivera was like the top uh, Chicano singer, Hispanic singer. She unfortunately died in the airplane crash. I wrote her last English album. So not just within hip hop, with Hall of Famers, uh, people who sing King Tieta, even rapping in Spanish, Japanese, all kind of stuff. I, I did a little bit something different, like an alien. Yeah. So that's why they call me the Anunnaki. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. Different. I love it, man. I, I love that song you did on on the movie Old School too. That was cool. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That was that was a that was a crazy movie, man. That was a good experience. Yeah. And that's one thing I could say, you know, uh, Snoop, being around Snoop. Because I already knew Snoop before he auditioned for us above the law and cocaine in 1990. Originally, it was going to sign wow. to above the law, you know, but death row started. We had a chance to go to death row, but we we stayed with uh, Ruthless Records and rekindled our business relationship. But I knew Snoop for a long time. Yeah. You know, he knew the type of sound, you know, that above the law and cocaine created. And he definitely wanted that particular sound and style, especially after coming off the no limit. And he was just like, it sound kind of altered. Yeah, It was kind of conformed to the New Orleans sound. But when cocaine came in and other cats came in, we got Snoop Dogg right back to where he need to be. Yeah. 
You know what I'm saying? So, you know, recipe. it was a blessing working with him because I got a chance to meet more people. A lot of people, you know, some people don't even know. They'd be like, man, I first heard you on Doghouse and you was the backup singer for last night. I was like, no, bro. <laughs> Snoop's my little homeboy. He was in the game. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? After, you know, of course, after, you know, the Ruthless record success. So. Yeah. And how was how it when you when you left Ruthless? Was like was that a hard transition? No, it was it was sad. Yeah. yeah. Because when Ruth when 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 Eric Wright died, uh it was time for me to go. It wasn't no such thing as Ruthless Records. Yeah. To me. And Yellow felt the same way. We went to Scotty Brothers and did uh, a song called This Is For The E. And it was a heartfelt song. You see little E3 in his in the funeral. Um, it was it was sad, but we had to move on because the last time I saw Eric, it was me, uh Cole 187, uh Jada Pickett at that time, because that's our little homegirl, Jada Pickett. Of course, he went on to marry Will Smith. Um, and Easy E and Easy was kind of coughing, but he had asthma. Yeah. But he, you know, he had a positive attitude about it, you know. And then weeks later, you know, we hear the unfortunate news. And after his passing, it just, you know, it was dark. It was yeah. kind of like when Michael Jackson passed. Yeah. It's like, it was dark. And then it was crazy because we did a record called For Riders Only and This Is For The E. And then... A year later, my little bro, I love dearly, would, would, would unfortunately get killed. And that was Tupac. Yeah. So 95, 96, those were the darkest points yeah. in my career because we lost Easy and we lost Pop. But then going on in the early 2000s, we lost KMG, we lost Nate Dog, we lost Nipson. You know, I'm I'm just thank, thankful that I'm able to tell people that may not have known, you know, how this was and what time period this was and how how they felt. You know what I mean? It's just elating to be able to 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 share that with the audience. Yeah, for sure. Uh, what experience, what was Tupac like with you? Uh, Tupac was a soldier. He, he was, he was, he was wild. Yeah. He was firm. He was military minded. He knew how to laugh. He knew how to joke. You know, he was serious. Yeah. But you got to think about it, man. Tupac was 25 years old. Right. We were all, we we're all, our maturity level didn't peak yet. So, yeah. our oldest CEO was like 26, 27. That was easy. We were yeah. young. And, you know, if Pop would have been here, most likely he would have been in politics. Yeah, for sure. You know what I mean? Because he would have had a chance to grow. Um, maybe had a chance to, 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 to develop a relationship with a woman to where he can have kids. But, you know, it's a reason so many years later that we still talking about Pop. So whatever short duration that the universe allowed him to be, the impact is forever, man. And I miss him dearly. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I, I miss all my people that they hear, man. It's, you know, I have to talk to my brain every time I'm in an interview so I don't choke up. Yeah. Because that's how much I love my brothers. Yeah, no doubt. I can, I can tell as, as far as it's seen. And yeah. yeah I love, yeah, I love Park Center too and the Outlaws. I always follow them. Yeah. And, um, yeah, it was, it, it's crazy. But yeah, the upside of it is, is that it's a beautiful time to share stories, man. Yeah. People are not into storytelling no more. We used to sit by. The campfire, roasted marshmallows, or we, we be in the living room listening to them good old days that Granny talked. And I, I'm just glad I'm I'm happy 
as an elder now yeah. and still very much relevant in the music of my own company, Buddy Boy Entertainment. But it's a beautiful thing to to share how it really was. Yeah, man, for sure. Uh, what, what's your process like? Say you want to make a song. Like, What's your process that you go through? I have to be inspired. I will never make a song forcing myself to make a song. Yeah. And I'm a workaholic, you know, like a like a crackhead likes crack. I love music. I'm never satisfied in music. That's why I'm always working. Yep. You know, so I don't know. It's, you know, it depends. Yeah, like if someone's gonna make their first song, like they're just getting into music, yeah. um, what what advice would you give them? Um, study, study what you want to get into first to see if you really want to get into it. Because a lot of people see, see things on the surface. Oh, lights, camera. Oh, oh. but they don't know what's behind the closed curtain. Yeah. Look what's behind the closed curtain. Take that aspect first. And then that'll let you know, are you ready? Are you prepared? Because you got to prepare yourself to go through so many obstacles. But if you're really genuine and you're really consistent and work hard and you put the type of energy, good energy and sensation about your stuff, you'll be surprised, man. The universe will move mountains for you. But first and foremost, you have to understand the schematics of this business, period. Yeah. You do that first then your creativity is, is is going to do what it's supposed to do because a lot of people get discouraged. They put out records and they'd be good artists, but because they didn't understand the business, you're just another artist with 90 million other records on Apple. It's yeah. not going to do nothing. You have to, you kind of like got to be the sperm cell to get to the egg because a <laughs> lot of sperm cells just don't get to the egg. Yeah, that's a good way of looking at it. That's cool. Is there anyone that you haven't worked with that you'd like to? I would have loved to work with Michael Jackson. Yeah. I had a chance to, but oh. you know, Dr. Dre turned that down. Uh Hutch Hutch originally sampled um Billy Jean, but Michael was like, Dr. Dre gotta give me six beats with no publishing, and we turned it down. That was when I was at Epic Records before the Who Am I album in 1990. Wow. But I I, I, I like to work with, J I like J. Cole. Yeah. I really like J. Cole. I, like, I love Brother Kendrick. Yeah. You know, those type of, you know, and, and artists that, that are the new artists, I don't really get into that, man. I don't knock their hustle, but I'm old school, man. Yeah. If I can't, if I can't put on some Sade or some Luther Vandross or some Parliament and your shit don't move me like that, I just stay away from it. You know, everybody don't like apples. You know what I mean? Because I like peaches more than apples and I stick to the peaches. They taste sweeter. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know a lot of the new artists now. I'm, I feel like, yeah, it's a whole different feeling. Yeah. It's sad because a lot of the artists that I hear now, I hear about them after they get killed. Yeah, and that's sad. And we're not on that because music is so powerful; it could either influence you to do the right things, influence you to do the wrong things. But I believe that music or anything needs to have an order of yin and yang, a balance. And whenever that thing is unbalanced I'll show you the landscape of the communities that's why you got more deaths you got more killings you got more disrespect it's because the music is is geared towards more disrespect not all of it but especially popular music with some of the youngsters over here in the United States that's why you 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 know it's sad because the major companies don't care because some of them put life insurances on the artists 
and they expect them to kill themselves. They expect them to continue to perpetuate those frequencies of influence of negativity and different things. And then you have people like K-pop who really is doing the music from the 90s and the 80s and really killing the game. Yeah. And they putting out positivity out there. So I don't think it's not about Save the Lung Foundation. You know what I mean? Yeah. I believe you can do a training day movie by Denzel Washington, which was very gangster. But I believe you can do a Malcolm X movie that is gangster and positive, and they both popular. Yeah. So when I make my moves nowadays, it's not for the United States market. Of course, I don't forget about my own backyard. But it's mainly for cats like yourself in Australia, Denmark, Belgium, Tanzania, Africa, Japan, South Korea, Canada. Because the music that I do, it's, it, it, it will touch the world as opposed to, you know, just making up a song. And I always like to inspire the audience and my fans out there. I've always everything Since I checked in the game, you might hear some gangster shit, but you're also going to hear some medicine in the food when you eat this food man that's cool that's, what, what was it like the feeling when you made your first album you know first going into the studio oh it's very exciting you know it's uh it's a euphoria yeah you know it's it's exciting man hearing your stuff on the radio for the first time and, yeah you know but after you absorb that you you know other people be more happy for you. It'd just be like a regular thing. Oh, you heard me on the radio. Huh? But when you <laughs> first, when you first get in, and because I went out, I I was on the only NWA tour in London, the only one they ever did. Oh, and that was very exciting, man. Like to see some crazy things. I can't share to your audience. <laughs> it was some wild parties, bro. It was crazy. <laughs> But it's a, it's an experience, and you know, yeah. It um it let me here today. Yeah. yeah, that's cool. Are you, are you working on anything at the moment? Yes, we got an incredible project coming out. Me and Cole One Eighty Seven. It's called AOGF, which stands for Architects of G Funk. And since we're the creators of this style of genre of music that really mirrored. P funk now, G funk is all over the world. We have now created a funk and soul hip hop band called AOGF, which stands for Architects of G Funk. Mm -hmm. And that record is an independent record. It's put out by uh, my company, Buddy Boy Entertainment, and Cold 187's company called Westworld. And the project is coming out September the 18th, um, which you got to go exclusively. To get this album, it's a collector's album. You won't see it on Spotify. You won't see it on Apple. We ain't concerned about the streaming fuckery. You got to go directly to my site at www.bud, E is in Eric, B O Y E, uh, music.com. That's buddyboymusic.com. The link there is right there on my bio. The pre orders are up till September the 10th. But it's an incredible album. It's funk, soul, orientated, social conscious. You know, if you're really into the G-Funk sound and just funk, you're going to love this project. We also have a single. It's called The Boogeyman. That's the first single off the project. We have Return, which that's the album by AOGF. And that single is everywhere. We will put out all singles off the new album on the digital platforms. But in order to get the new architects of G Funk, brand new funk and soul group, you gotta go directly to our site at buddyboymusic.com. So September the 18th, we about to land the mothership. And I like like the way we're doing it because so many people, they're doing the streaming company and streaming companies are raping people. So we only put out singles to bring things and consolidate things to our own personal site because you know, for a while, they try to make music really a hobby, and that's sad. Yeah. So we put a lot of money into our projects. There's flights, there's marketing. And this way, we get a chance to control the purse, 
and let them know this is a hot commodity. You know what I mean? This is this this is an incredible project from the guys that that actually created this genre of music, which years later you hear the influences, you hear the Warren G's, you hear the Snoop. They took what we created and brought it across the world, but we're bringing it back home to the Mecca, the ones that actually created it. Man, I'll, I'll be putting a link on the interview too, man. That's I'm getting yeah. it. Yeah, man, it's 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 pretty pricey, but we got to get back into uh, uh, um, the artists and and the fans. Yeah, you know, we make music for the fans. We don't make music just to get on streaming companies and and all that. No, I rather talk to a hundred thousand people and have direct marketing with fans yeah. than to have a hundred million streams. It's not going to do you no good. There's different price range. And we got to be able to keep our music. So to all the fans out there, man, I, we could not thank you enough because they really, they really proud to pay, man. I, the comments I be getting, they be like, man, look, man, I was going to buy some weed today, but I'll pay 60 bucks for a cocaine and, yeah. and a Cole 187 album. It's not coming out nowhere else. There's going to be a collector's album. I'm a mess with it. That's why I really love the overseas market because they get it. I just put out a record last year with with uh, Cool Rock Ski from the iconic group, the Fat Boys. And that song is called Hush, and people overseas is really taken to it. And we got some people back home that, you know, under the layer of what's popular, they want to hear this good funk and soul instrumentation, subject matter, storytelling, consciousness. You know what I mean? Yeah. Being the world is our oyster and architects of G Funk will land the mothership on all parts of this continent. Trust that. Yeah, I'm bored. Man, I'll, I'll, I'll be getting it for sure. Thanks, man. Appreciate that. Yeah. And I'll send you over the single. If you have any DJs, it's yeah. just like the barter system, brother. I'll scratch your back. You scratch mine. Get the word out there. The 100%. architects of G Funk is is we're the people's champion, not the Indian, not the not the industry champ. We're the people's champ. Yeah, I love it. It's so down to earth, man. It's cool. Thanks, man. And shout out to uh DJ D, Babe D. That's the homegirl out there in Australia. Shout out to Coop DeVille. That's my boy in Smellsborn. You know what I mean? Because they be smelling funky out there. You know what I mean? They do that funk. And uh, really got a heart for uh, the land down under. You know, really got a heart for all my peoples out there. They yeah, they kept us afloat and they, they know how to keep it funky. Yeah, they got a lot of supporters out here, man. You have to come out here soon. Oh, next year. I don't want to make a big, big announcement yet, but I guess I just did. Okay, so it's yeah. out there now. Yeah, I'll be coming out there soon. But my daughter is definitely coming. She yeah. has to go to South Korea real quick. She's doing a K-pop record too. Oh, and, cool. Uh, yeah, man. We, you know, the 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 culture is the world now, not yeah. just in the United States. Everywhere. It's the world. Man, that's awesome. I'll, I'll, be, I'll be promoting everything you do, yeah. And, yeah, and your I daughter's music that. too. That's that's so cool. Yeah, she has a project coming out. Shout out to Anissa Long, aka Young Colombiana. She has a project coming out called Karma is a Bitch. And uh she she's like daddy, like daughter. She can sing, she can rap, she's into different other styles. She does alternative too, just as well as she's venturing out into K-pop. Her project is coming out next year, and also after the Architects of G Funk. I'm coming out with the adventures of Dr. Kokenstein. That's oh, a solo by myself. Man, <laughs> that's gonna be sick. Yeah, so it's it. we go. We we definitely gonna land these these UAPs. Yeah, you know, on them, and uh, hopefully, man, that you know the word can get spread out a lot faster because yeah. we want we made this record strictly for the hardcore G Funk fans. Yeah. Man, I ain't this. Yeah, I can't wait. It's gonna take off. 
<laughs> yeah, you, yeah, you got heaps of people in Australia. You know, love you, and I think you'll definitely be awesome for you to come here, man. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We was even talking about getting some property out there, so who knows? Yeah, yeah, do it. You can come mm -hmm. over a holiday every year. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's gonna be cool. Like I said, I got a, a guy out there named Coop Deville. He just came over here. He do he do a lot of uh, incredible things uh, as a musician. Plus, he build guitars and different other things. Um, you know, his queen. She's over there on on the regular television news and all kind of stuff. So, wow. you know, he's definitely. Um, and plus, he play on some of my music too, man. So, my so, connections with Australia is really. Really on point. Yeah, that's I love that. What um, uh, I was want to touch about yeah, sugar cane with sugar free man. That was awesome. Yeah, we were going to come out with the project this year, yeah. but you know the business got to be right. So you yeah. know between us three, you know with his manager, we felt the prior distribution didn't do that. They kind of dropped the ball. So next year. We're very optimistic that the sugar cane will come out with the right type of marketing dollars and budget behind it. Yeah. So you gotta have the right budget, man, because we came up with an incredible project. It's a fun project that uh, me and Sugar Free created, but we wanna make sure, you know, it's it's congruent to the marketing dollars as well. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like he's got a special you know, like connection and, and like same with you and Cold 187. It's just you get excited when you hear those names go together. It's the P, man. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, that's it. Um, what other, um, like, do you have any other ventures that you go into when you're not doing music? What are you, what are you doing like every day? I'm, bu you? I'm building with my, my, my wife. Or my children, our children. Yep. You know, um, it's eighty six thousand four hundred seconds in a day. I don't do music all the time. My 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 best music is with my family, metaphorically speaking. Yeah, that's my best music. You know what I mean? A lot of people come to me and they say, they say, "Man, you did all this. How how does it feel?" I said, it feels good, but let me tell you what the real success is. Being with a woman for 38 years, married 32 of those years, and have four boys and four girls, and nine and one of them was in jail, in trouble, and sick, or whatever it is. So my real claim to fame is, is being a family man, as opposed to being the most featured artist. Wow, well, man. That's cool. I always see your person, you know, with your family too. So you can just tell that he's got a mm -hmm. tight crew. I love it. Thanks, man. Uh, I don't want to take up too much of your time. I appreciate you coming. Is it right for just do a couple more questions with you? Yeah, yeah, it's all good. Sweet. Um, all right, what's, what's your top three albums of all time? Top three? Yeah. Rap, R and B, heavy metal. Any, yep. Any one of them? Yep. Uh, I'm gonna keep it old school. Next time I'm on, we'll do the hip hop version. Okay. But um Donnie Hathaway. Um Parliament Funkadelic. And I would say my uncle Willie Hutch. Yeah. Uh, that's called 187's uh dad. Yeah, that's our uncle. Cold yeah. 187 is my cousin. That's cool, yeah. Yeah. It's got like one super talented family. That's cool. Thanks, man. What was it like working with, with Snoop when you first linked up? Uh, it was cool. I mean, I met Snoop. Snoop auditioned for a bug along cocaine in Inglewood, California at the end of 1990. And uh, Warren G used to always say, man, I'm going to bring my guy up here 
And as soon as my homeboy come back from the military, I'm going to bring him up there, which was named Daniel, Nate Dog. So me, me and Warren G actually used to stay with Cole 187 in Colton, California. Uh, apartment 187 called the Cottonwood Apartments. So a lot of stuff that Warren G do, you know, he'll tell you himself he picked up from, from above the law. And then a year later, after 89 into 90, he introduced us to Slim, which is Snoop Dogg, and Nathaniel, which is Nate Dogg. And they auditioned long before Death Row, long before Dre. They auditioned for Above the Law, wow. Code 187. So I already knew Snoop. He was yeah. a fan of mine wow. back then. Wow. And then we became comrades. And then in 1990, uh, 99, we recently hooked back up because he created a group called the East Siders. Yep. So once he created the East Siders, he already know the sound. That, that that he also in love all too well was developed from our camp and he wanted that particular sound. So I went over there and gave him the sound that was created from a bubble on cocaine. That's why you got the last meal. That's why you got eight songs on the last meal. That's why you got 11 songs on deuces and trays. That's why you got four, the five songs on Snoop Dogg presents. That's why you got the doggy all store because he was really intrigued wholeheartedly with that sound from cocaine unless he would have used Nate dog more than cocaine but he yeah. used cocaine on that particular journey doghouse journey and he used it for a reason you know when you first meet people like you met Nate dog and you're already doing your thing like you're already successful when you meet these guys can you see it like what you see in yourself do you go okay these guys have got it too Absolutely. When I first heard Snoop audition in 90, I was like, man, he one of the coldest freestylers I ever heard. Yeah. Hutch was saying the same thing. And then at a time where Warren G, uh, you know, they was formulating death row, Warren G took him over to a party. And Dr. Dre, you know, knew that Hutch, Co-187, wanted to put this kid Snoop Dogg on that Warren G brought up there so um a lot of people don't know this but dr dre called snoop dogg and said man i know you're working on this project and that project is it cool what, what do you think i should get his dude a shot is it cool i said yeah man snoop dogg's incredible and that started snoop dogg career wow man that's that's a crazy story man that's that's the truth yeah i mean you won't have nobody come back and say Reviewed yeah. it no, nowhere else because they can't. That's the yeah. truth. And it's not it's not saying that's the bad thing. That's how that's how it snowballed for Calvin yeah. Brodus is that he auditioned for us first. No, for sure, man. I can just tell you, like, yeah, you're a good mentor already. Like you mm -hmm. just you got it. But we already knew each other. We had a yeah. kind of like develop a working relationship in the nineties though. Yeah. Did you have a moment where you knew you were going to be successful? Um, I thought that way at, at four, 15 years old. You know, doing talent shows, and you know, like 83 and different other stuff like that. I knew this is where I wanted to be. Wow. And plus, you know, my dad, you know, yeah. like, I know I'm going to be somebody. And back then, my name was called Jay Golden. Cause my grandmother named me that cause I got green color eyes and stuff. Yeah. So it was actually my cousin Cole 187 said, when you come to Ruthless, it was like nothing against our granny, but you know, your name need to, need to be hard. Like in every way. <laughs> I said, what is it? He said, he said, I'm going to call you cocaine because when people hear your, your hook, it's like they go get hooked yeah. on some drugs and shit, but it's music. Yeah. I sat back and I said, that's the dopest name in the game. Yeah. Cocaine. Yes. Man, glad you did. You, this, this <laughs> cool. uh, if it, you have a, like a message you're going to put out to the world? Or, you know, like... Um, Love what you do or don't do it at all. Loving what you do means that normally the results don't even come. 
but because you love what you do, you stay consistent and you be optimistic. You know what I mean? Love what you do or don't do it at all. I love what I did. So I love doing music. But was there many times I wanted to give up? Yeah. But because I love what I do, I stay consistent through the bullshit. And I'm here today. And I'm telling you, it works. It works when you love what you do. And if you don't love what you do, figure out some things that excite you. You know what I mean? Mine's in particular is just music. Not so much the lights, camera, and action. It's music. Yeah. You know what I mean? So if you're serious about music, you also got to keep the, in the equation things that come with this business of doing music. Study the business first. Take your time. Remember, when you're going to a university, you don't get your college degree when you're a freshman. Thank you.